1937, Alan was 22 years old, and but his father was in his 60s. He wanted to retire, and he told the library, I'm appointing my son to be the acting curator. Well, in effect, he was in charge. It was a room not bigger than this apartment, stacks of records gathering dust. He had to catalog them. So I did a preliminary job of listening to records, and I'd listen to them and say, oh, this is a good one. It's the real thing. Or I'd say, this is just commercial junk. Well, he had the energy of a young man, and uh, uh, during the next six years, he did more probably than most men would do in their lifetime. Probably my most upsetting experience with him was when he was showing his work um, with Cantometrics to the American Folklore Society in Philadelphia. He gave this impassioned talk about the connection between the way you work, your gender relations, and the way you sing. And they tore him to ribbons because he hadn't uh, done all of his homework and because he made some very sweeping generalizations that you could find exceptions to. And he was devastated, absolutely devastated, because this was where he wanted to be, to validate his work in front of the experts. Usually, scientists scoff at social scientists and say, you're not scientists, you just have opinions. But to be a scientist, you must use numbers. So we got an IBM card. In those days, they used a piece of paper with 37 different categories. Is there a song loud or soft? Is it sung high or low? Is it long or short? Does it have a lot of repetition or no repetition? Is it sung with a nasal tone of voice? Or is it sung with a throaty tone of voice? And he would put a little dot on this IBM card from one to 10. And when he had categorized 36 categories, he drew a line between them and called, this is the profile of that style of music. I can't comprehend how anyone would try to, to map world music, you know, with all these different categories in it, when you realise there's so many thousands of, of types of folk music in the world. But that didn't deter him. <laughs> Why did he do it? He was driven. He loved, he, I think he just loved this music so much. And I think he wanted to understand it perfectly himself. I asked my nephew, who's an ethnomusicologist, uh, who worked at Smithsonian many years, uh, why is it that not everybody agreed with Alan? And he said, well, he makes uh, leaps of intuition which he can't prove. <laughs> well, I said, I'd trust Alan's intuition more than somebody else's proof often because he did have a great intuition.